Welcome, everyone. This is Toronto Geometry Colloquium, and this is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. Today, we are thrilled to have Leanne Makatura as our opener to talk about optimal design of different objects, and Dr. Stephanie Wang as our headliner to talk about a whole new way of representing geometry. If you have any questions for the speakers, you can write them either in the YouTube live chat that you should have next uh, to the right of this video, or in our Discord, the Discord channel that we'll send the, the link to right now. Uh, if you send the questions early rather than at the end of the talk, it'll give us time to curate a better Q&A session. So uh, send those questions as you have them rather than wait at the end. Our first speaker today is Leanne Makatura. She is a PhD student at MIT, supervised by Wojtek Matusik, uh, a Fulbright scholar, an NSF graduate research fellow, and a thousand other honors I can't read right now because uh, I don't have time. Her work spans many areas from replicating outdoor climbing to gardening knitting, uh, which as far as I can tell, it sounds like that spectrum encompasses like the whole of the human endeavor from climbing to knitting. Uh, I'm also very proud to say that she's the first ever Toronto Geometry Colloquium speaker to have a complete giraffe dedicated section on her website. So I'm very excited for this talk. Like, let us all give a warm welcome to Leanne Makatura. You can take it away. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so I'm so excited to be here today to present our paper, Pareto Gamuts, Exploring Optimal Designs Across Varying Contexts. This is a joint work with Ming Hao Kuo, Adriana Schultz, Justin Solomon, and Wojciech Matusik. So the title has lots of moving parts, um, and we're going to break it down sort of piece by piece, beginning with the idea of optimal designs. Most manufactured objects are designed with a set of high-level functional goals in mind. So our wind turbine should be compact with high power output, bicycle components should be lightweight and sturdy, and the solar roof should maximize the amount of energy that it captures throughout the day. These goals typically conflict. For our turbine, uh, we see that the original design is quite compact, but it offers low power output. If we try a different point in our design space, we see that it offers the complete opposite profile. Since both designs offer unique strengths, neither one is strictly better than the other. Note, we always assume that performance metrics have been formulated for minimization, so the most desirable designs will map either near the origin or along one of the axes. This visualization gives us an easy way to identify designs that are not optimal as well, like this one, which offers strictly worse power output for the same compactness score as our long-bladed design. After removing these dominated designs, we're left with the so-called Pareto optimal points. The designs themselves form the Pareto set, and the image of each design in performance space yields the Pareto front. These Pareto fronts are critical because they allow engineers to understand the achievable performance trade-offs for a given problem. Then the engineer can select a particular design from that front based on the needs of the problem at hand. There's already a rich history of related work that tries to solve this problem, and the field is constantly improving to try and find this Pareto front faster or with higher density or using fewer function evaluations along the way. However, we were interested in the fact that this standard multi-objective optimization setup doesn't quite capture real world scenarios because it only produces designs that are optimal with respect to some specific known set of assumptions about the surrounding world, or as we call it, the context. For the wind turbine, the context might be the wind speed at the installation site. The speed is usually embedded as a constant in the performance metric, so the optimization spits out a Pareto set in front corresponding to some particular choice of this value, in this case, six meters a second. To study the Pareto set in front at a different wind value, you have to change your function and then start again. Since wind speed is dynamic in practice, we usually have to study many speeds, but it's time consuming to compute each one at a time. Most of our examples actually exhibit the same problem. For the grid shell, a fixed context front might capture the trade-off between designs that perform well in the morning versus in the evening. But if I change something like the orientation of the house, the grid shell that yields any particular performance changes quite dramatically. This orientation is very important for the aesthetics of the final design and also how it fits in with its surroundings but it doesn't really impact the metrics that we've defined. In addition, it's very hard to build an objective function that captures any qualities 
uh, like aesthetics. And so the parameters affecting more qualitative uh, metrics are typically treated as a context in that they're explored manually and one at a time. Lastly, our bicycle has several parts that are individually optimized for metrics like mass and compliance. Every optimization must preserve the location of the interfaces between the parts so that any design on the resulting Pareto front will fit into the desired assembly. As you might have guessed, engineers often explore many possible locations for these pivots because the pivot position directly determines the bike's overall suspension behavior, which is typically customized for different riders. Unfortunately, every time you move these bolts, you have to uh, compute a new Pareto front for every adjacent part connected to them. The main takeaway from these examples is that it's very common for designers to want not just a single Pareto front corresponding to some context, but rather a whole collection of Pareto fronts corresponding to a range of context values that are of interest. To organize these many Pareto sets and fronts, we imagine augmenting our design and performance spaces with an additional axis for each context. Then as we discover each Pareto set and front, we can simply stack them along our additional uh, axes according to their context values. As we collect more and more of these Pareto fronts, we start to see a clear dependence emerging that characterizes how the Pareto set and front change as a function of a smooth context. The union of all the Pareto fronts in particular is what we've defined as the Pareto gamut. And the central technical challenge for our paper is to discover the full Pareto gamut directly rather than building it up one fixed context slice at a time. We do this by generalizing an existing approach for fixed context optimization called a local global scheme. We'll take a look at this first in the standard reduced space, and then we'll lift it to our Pareto space later. Um, in the first step, we try to find some point on the Pareto front by selecting a target point with some ideal but generally impossible trade-off. Then we pair it with a randomly chosen seed point that probably performs poorly, and we try to push the seed point toward the Pareto front by minimizing the distance between it and the target we've chosen. To uncover more of the front, we actually note that the Pareto front and set are locally manifolds. This means every optimal point is surrounded by a neighborhood of other optimal points. So if we can strategically explore around this area, we can actually uncover whole patches of the front without additional optimizations. This approach hinges on the so-called KKT conditions, which must be satisfied by every optimal point, including the one we've already found. Thus, we only need to search for nearby points that preserve the KKT conditions. If the Pareto front is parameterized by some local parameter T, then we can ensure preservation of these conditions by differentiating them with respect to T and setting that derivative equal to zero. After some algebra, we end up with a linear system of the following form, which means that any suitable vector x prime of t is a perturbation direction along which we can walk from our initial point without violating the KKT conditions. This essentially defines a patch of the Pareto set and the front centered about our initially discovered point as we were hoping. By repeating these steps, the local global method efficiently finds the full Pareto set and front for a particular fixed context, that is, some particular slice of our Pareto gamut. To discover the full gamut, we actually need to generalize this expansion step so we can move across contexts as well. And we do this by modifying the KKT condition slightly, taking care to reflect the fact that our contexts can't quite be treated the same as design variables. But then, after we've established that, everything mostly proceeds as before. However, now at the end of the day, our perturbation directions give us a way not only to move within a design space, uh, within a fixed context space, x prime, but also across uh, contexts as well, which is given by the z prime components. So the subspace spanned by all such satisfying directions define an entire patch of the Pareto gamut as we desired. Now we've arrived at our full discovery algorithm. So we sample several designs throughout the augmented space <clears throat> and then we push them toward the Pareto gamut using the target seed method uh, described before. Once we have these points on the initial uh, Pareto gamut, we're able to explore and find entire patches of the gamut by computing our continuation scheme and uh, expanding the patches as before. Once we've discovered the full Pareto gamut, we're able to return it to the user so they can be begin exploring their optimal designs. Uh, for this presentation, we'll begin with the turbine results, and we first note that from this point on, we'll plot the context along the vertical axis for ease of visualization. As expected, the Pareto fronts extracted from our gamut are indistinguishable from those that are found by fixed context methods, which suggests that our solution is both correct and high quality. However, to justify computing this gamut, we must examine the cost of this computation in the first place. 
For the turbine shown before, our method requires about 100,000 samples in order to output the equivalent of about 200 fixed context fronts. We also use two state-of-the-art fixed context methods to independently compute those same 200 Pareto fronts. Both methods require over an order of magnitude more function evaluations to reach the same density as our gamut. Even for small values of n, the cost of repeatedly computing these fronts rapidly exceeds the cost of our full Pareto gamut, which suggests that our approach is feasible and immediately relevant for engineers um, who are already exploring this many contexts to create robust designs. This gamut's extra context information is also really helpful in situations like this wind turbine where the context is dynamic in practice. So even once we've selected a particular design from some context, we still care about its performance in other contexts as well. By plotting the design's performance curve shown in red next to the Pareto gamut, we can actually begin to understand a particular design's strengths where it's close to the gamut and its weaknesses where it's far away relative to the achievable optima in each uh, context. We can also numerically quantify this, this quality in order to provide a form of sensitivity analysis so engineers can avoid designs that are overly optimized for some context, but poorly performant in many other plausible regions. Now we look at the bicycle. The Pareto gamut for each part is computed independently with a shared context that controls the shared uh, pivot position. This allows the engineers to move the pivot positions in order to achieve the desired suspension characteristics, while also immediately ensuring that each affected part remains sufficiently performant. This actually shows us how the Pareto gamut might be useful for facilitating complex hierarchical design by decomposing a complicated problem into smaller, more tractable pieces that are linked by adjustable constraints. And for the solar roof, our Pareto gamut allows us to treat subjective parameters like the building orientation as a context and efficiently optimize the quantifiable metrics over several possible scenarios. Even with a large design space of up to 400 variables, our algorithm is able to identify the full Pareto gamut. All of our Pareto gamuts so far have featured two performance metrics and a single context, which is related to a limitation that the surface area of the Pareto gamut grows exponentially in the sum of these two components. Fixed context Pareto fronts also suffer from this problem, and they're generally considered intractable for more than three performance metrics at a time. Since our dimensionality grows with this additional context dimension as well, it raises the concern that engineers might have to choose between optimizing a, um, a third performance metric or a context. So to address this, we also created two problems with four dimensional gamuts, the lamp with three performance and one con context parameter, or the bicopter with two of each. And in both cases, we're able to find uh, the Pareto gamut quite well. However, moving forward, uh, this this limit beyond this limit is intractable for us as well. Um, so to move towards five or more metrics or contexts, it'd be interesting to look into more interactive optimization methods. And to make this approach more accessible for engineers and other practitioners, it'll be important to create an intuitive UI and also to permit the use of more complicated performance metrics, such as differentiable simulators. But overall, we feel excited that this is a good step toward robust design optimization, and we're excited to see where it goes next. For now, thanks for listening, and I'm excited to, to hear your questions later. Thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, that was perhaps the most optimal presentations we've had so far. Uh, the, thank you. We'll, we'll go straight to our headliners uh, presentation, but do write down your questions for Leanne, and I'll have the pleasure of asking her um, later on after our headliners talk. Um, Dr. Stephanie Wang is a postdoc at the University of California in San Diego, supervised by Professor Alec Albert Chern. Sorry. She is well known in our community for her PhD work in UCLA on the material point method and simulating everything from uh, cooking and baking to fracture and how hair moves. But in the, pa in the past year or so, she has moved away from simulation and, and into the more uh, mathematical side of geometry processing as exemplified by her amazing recent work on minimal surfaces, which I hope she'll at least cover a little bit of today. I was doing a little online sleuthing uh, on Stephanie Wang um, to find something funny to say in this introduction. And lo and behold, I found out she speaks some Spanish apparently. So maybe we'll have the Q&A session in Spanish at the end of the talk, if, if she likes that. Uh, let us all oh, give a warm cool. welcome to Dr. Stephanie Wang. Hello everyone. <laughs> Um, okay, I don't see myself, but I hope you all see me. Whoa, 
That's so rude. Someone call me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the, the the title of my talk is Capturing Surfaces with Differential Forms. But before we go there, I will first introduce myself as Stephanie Wong, working at UC San Diego. Uh, so you're, you, you really need to present yourself with your PhD work. So here it is, uh, Crashing the Orange using Material Point Method. I got my PhD in mathematics at UCLA. Uh, the dissertation is on Material Point Method for elastoplasticity, yada, 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 just like what Sylvia had just said. Uh, so for those who are not super familiar with simulations, Material Point Method is a multi-species simulation with automatic collision. Uh, meaning that you don't have to especially run different uh, an additional process to detect if your meshes are colliding. Um, now, uh, the part that I thought that this uh, dissertation was interesting is that we really focus on building these fracturing surfaces, uh, especially we found a way to fracture something in uh, a particle-based simulation method uh, that Re, uh, that maintains the texture of the original mesh. Uh, well, so that is also about surfaces, but in my postdoc, uh, we decided that outside of capturing surfaces, you know, when they fractures, we also want to use a different angle to look at surfaces. So therefore this new paper uh, with Professor Oberturn called Computing Minimal Surfaces with Differential Forms, uh, which was presented earlier this year at CGREF 2021. And that will be the majority of this talk. Uh, here are some teasers, and I hope you all like to see some uh, funny, glittery things rotating uh, because they're fun to look at. Uh, so to sort of motivate a little bit on the entire minimal surfaces problems, uh, so on the upper left, we know that if we put, uh, we fix some boundary wires uh, and then dip that into the soapy uh, solutions, then we can usually expect some very intricate uh, surface that's formed by these soap films. And then uh, on the lower left and on the right, we can see some architectures with uh, surfaces or geometries that are really inspired or indeed is uh, minimal, a minimal surface. Uh, and of course, we or nothing without our history. So well, let's have this very brief history uh, review of minimal surfaces. So just know that this is not meant to be a complete uh, history because there's way too much to be fit into one PDF. Uh, the very first appearance of minimal surfaces was in 1760. So let me get a pointer here. Okay. Uh, so in the very first work on calculus of variation by Joseph Lagrange, uh, he specifically used the surface area functional on high fields, of course, uh, as an example. So this was in the appendix of his very first, you know, calculus of variation uh, work. Um, so then he derived the Euler Lagrange equation for. Um, surface area functional minimization. And then after this uh, appearance of the, so, uh, the idea of minimal surfaces, uh, people started discovering different kinds of minimal surfaces, uh, surfaces including helicoids, catenoid, or some periodic ones, or inner per surface. Uh, and then people also found that, oh, this can actually be linked to some um, complex analysis. And then they found this wild stress representation uh, and inner per surfaces. <laughs> And then in 1873, uh, this uh, also Joseph uh, Plateau, he did some physical experiments and then really concluded the physical laws for uh, soap films, basically minimizing surface area because of uh, because of surface tensions. Now, just note that in his analysis, he also included the non-manifold cases. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, the interesting example is right here we have our very first computational um, computational paper on minimal surfaces, but this was done in 1927. So guess what? This is a hand computed computational paper on minimal surfaces. They compute, so if you actually read the paper, you will see 
decimals. Uh, they actually did all of the computations by hand. Uh, so then they used finite difference, uh, finite difference method to solve the Euler Lagrange equation for high fields. And guess what? It is really slow to uh, compute with hands. So they use multi grid acceleration for their computation. Um, what a useful technique, right? Um, and then after that, there are some existence related proofs. Uh, and then, oops, oh, okay. Um, I guess I can just, yeah, get rid of those marks. And then we got into the era of digital computer, right? We no longer have to struggle with computing things by hand and using multigrid to accelerate. So people really started using finite difference or finite elements to comp uh, with Newton's method to compute minimal surfaces. And then it might be worth noting that uh, in 1960, uh, Federer and Flemond had this paper on geometric measure theory, and they also talked about minimal surfaces. Uh, the, what is worth noting is that they represented geometries as a measure or as a distribution rather than what we previously viewed them, which is just a piece of geometry, a, a manifold. Now, uh, after this, um, in about the 90s of 20, 20th century, um, curvature flow becomes a pretty hot topic uh, we have several people uh, using curvature flow on uh, triangular meshes, and then they computed all kinds of uh, different, you know, it's this, at, around this time because we have meshes, so it's really not about functional function graphs anymore. This is, uh, you know, geometries of all kind. Um, so, and then uh, probably someone might have heard of Surface Evolver, which is apparently still a software that's used nowadays to find minimal surfaces. And then uh, the most uh, most used, and in fact still used today, uh, curvature flow method uh, to compute minimal surfaces is the H1 gradient flow by Pinkel and Portier in 1993. And then after this, people had various other type of uh, flows. Uh, we have Wilmer for uh, Wilmore flows, um, uh, for example, right here by uh, Crane, Pinkel, and Shoulder. Uh, and however, we previously mentioned this geometric measure theory. Some people also did the computation using uh, geometric measure theory. So then these computational results can be found uh, in the parks, parks and then Parks and Pitts, and then we have Dunfield, Hilani, and Day, uh, and some of these are uh, turned into the study of optimal homologous cycles, which is in a, um, in a uh, I guess, tetrahedralized domain. How do you find the optimal homologous cycle that has a certain boundary? So which at the end of the day is also very similar to the minimal surface problem, except that they have to go along the uh, the edges and faces of their uh, tetrahedral mesh. So to formalize this a little bit, right, we want to set up these uh, exemptions. We have a ambient manifold capital M, and then we are given a closed boundary curve gamma, uh, and we want to find a surface sigma such that it minimizes the surface area while its boundary is indeed specified by gamma. Now, a very well-known geometric processing fact is that area functional is not convex. And I'll prove it to you that area functional is not convex. Right here, I have the identical boundary wire, but uh, I can find two local minimum. And in fact, if you try to deform the mesh from one local minimum to the other, the surface area is going to increase and then decrease, no matter how you deform them. So you, this behavior of having two local minimum really says that this is not a convex functional, right? Uh, so that being said, right, how do we solve this problem? Well, we sit down and really look at the surface representations, which previously can be roughly uh, thought of being implicit and explicit. The implicit kinds are generally understood as the level sets, uh, meaning that surfaces are implicitly stored with a spatial function f, sometimes stored on, uh, most, most of the time stored on the grid. Ooh, how rude, get another spam call. Um, yeah, a lot of spam call going on here. Um, um, so 
Level sets are uh, are stored by storing a function on the entire 3D domain. And then when you do when you do want to extract a uh, surface, you just take the set where the surface uh, where the function is zero. Now the problem of this is that inherently uh, level sets are the boundary of a open region, which is where the function takes positive value. So if you consider taking the boundary of the boundary of a region, then you either end up in a situation uh, that is not very easy to compute. Uh, so most of the time you'll get empty set, but indeed you can think of a function where you know it's positive somewhere and it's just you know it's just zero on the one specific line, right? Then it is true. Then you can find, uh, you can define the boundary of this uh, this uh, sigma being the endpoint. But for uh, for conventional algorithms like marching cube, we uh, the way that we extract surfaces from level sets uh, that is not possible. Uh, so on the other hand, the mesh based methods have their own uh, own own problems, um, we compute the street coverage of flows, and not only does it sometimes run into ill-conditioned Laplacians due to low quality meshes, the uh, bigger problem is that we can never get away with the discrete operations used to resolve topological differences. So in this case, when I have a catenoid that uh, wants to be minimized into two flat disks, right? Uh, I the, the original mesh, the topology of the original mesh will connect the two disks with each other. And then we really don't want that very thin line to be there, right? So we either have to have a discrete operation to say, I'm going to kill all of these triangles, or when you just do brute force remeshing, then you have numerical instability. So our methods can resolve this absolutely no problem. We just go from whatever uh, uh, the boundary exactly to two disks. Uh, any topology can be resolved. Uh, here's more, one more example to convince you that we can resolve any topology. The, uh, the outline of this talk, the remaining of the talk, is that we will review differential forms and how they can be used as surface representations. And then we'll apply that to Plato's problem. And then we'll show the uh, fast ADMM algorithms and the results. And we'll talk about some generalizations of our work as in the new framework of mass norm minimizations. So what are differential forms, right? The title is we are going to capture surfaces with differential forms. Well, from multivariable calculus, we remember the integral of a function over a volumetric region. Now, if you take away the integral sign and then keep the dx d by dz, this is a three form. And then we also have uh, two forms, which are coming from surface integrals. You take surface integral and you keep the dy dz, dz dx, dx dy thing. This is a two form. And for a curve integral, if you keep the dx, dy dz, this is a one form. And at the very end for functions, you can evaluate that at one point. So this is a zero point, uh, zero form. Uh, so, how can we blend in the concept of a Dirac delta function into three form? So in this three form f of x, y, z, dx, dy, dz, for this particular function, let's say if we go from being in any smooth functions that we can understood to the Dirac delta, uh, which is function that's zero everywhere except infinity at some specific point, right? Then if we take this particular three form and multiply it with any test function phi, uh, then we know that for this Dirac delta, right, if you multiply it with another test function phi and we integrate a whole thing, we're going to get the function value of phi, the test, fun the test function at this particular point where you have your singularity. So if you have three forms, then it's really just oh, all of the mass of your, fun uh, of your delta p is concentrated on one particular point. So then we understood this concept of Dirac delta three form as something that takes your test function phi and map it to its value evaluated at the uh, at the point p. So it takes a function and map this maps it to a real number. And then what about two forms, right? So uh, for um, 
for curves, which is a two-dimensional geometry, right? They can, we can take any one form and integrate it on this curve, right? One-dimensional geometry, and then get the real number, which is the curve integral on it. So then we can think of it, we can represent this process of taking any one form uh, and then map it to the curve integral on gamma as taking eta, which is our test form, and then wedge product with a two form delta gamma, and then it will output this, uh, this curve integral. So then if we, uh, if we look at the vector, vector field representation of this delta gamma two form, then yeah, then it would just be the vector field with concentrated uh, magnitude along the curve gamma with really, really large magnitude, and it will be pointing to the direction of the tangent. Uh, so similarly, what about uh, surfaces, right? Surfaces, they take any test two forms, and then it will, uh, it can, surfaces can take any two forms and then map it to the integral of this two form on this particular surface. So if we think of it as taking this two form and wedge product it with one form, which is actually represented by this vector field. Um, we take the very concentrated normal vector of the surface, and that would be our delta sigma. Um, so taking all of these into consideration, right, the variable of our Plato's problem, the surface sigma, can actually just be thought of as this one form delta sigma, right? Or if you like vector uh, vector fields more, then just think about it as the very concentrated normal direction of the surface. And it's zero everywhere if it doesn't, uh, if it's not on the surface. Okay, so we have the constraint of our Plato's problem, which is the boundary of our sigma needs to be the same as the previously given curve gamma. Now, uh, we claim that this is the same as saying the exterior derivative of the uh, delta sigma has to be delta gamma. And how do we know that? Uh, well, to review uh, quickly, right? So Stokes theorem says it's something that says that it takes the um, take the derivative of something and integrate it over entire domain would be the same as integrating it. Uh, integrating this new on the boundary of it. So in other words, um, this, this relationship right here is if you take the boundary of n and it acted on new, take the boundary of n acted on new, it's the same as take the, the entirety of n acted on d new, which is d new. So in some sense, we can already see the connection between taking boundary of some geometry and the exterior derivative of our differential forms. Uh, more particular, uh, recall that weak derivatives is defined such that um, if you don't know, maybe f is not smooth enough, you can't really take the uh, conventional, de um, conventional derivative formula. Then you say, okay, weak derivative is something such that the integration by part formula is satisfied and all of the derivatives actually absorbed to these uh, you know, arbitrary te smooth test functions phi. So as a result, we say, um, we say that the weak derivative of differential forms is something such that if you take the smooth differential forms of the correct order, then, uh, so this is something that we are not entirely sure, right? But it is defined such that for all omega, right? It is true that the um, integration by part formula is satisfied where you can transfer the derivative from eta to omega. And then of course you can compute the things that's on the boundary. Um, so from there, if I have a Dirac delta one form, which is representing this surface, right? Then if I, what is the exterior derivative of my Dirac delta form of this vector field? So I tested, I test the derivative with some smooth form. Then using the definition of weak derivative, I can decompose it into uh, some boundary terms. And then I have, uh, I can transfer the de exterior derivative to my smooth test form d omega. Now, 
first thing is that we assume that sigma is not really interacting with the boundary of my ambient space M, or I can say that maybe I don't have boundary of my ambient space. For example, if I take a three-dimensional torus, so the entire thing goes away. And then the term that integrates D omega with delta sigma is really just integrating on over the entire sigma of D omega. Right? This is how we define delta sigma. Then from here, we take Stokes theorem. We see that, oh, integrating d omega inside a geometry is the same as integrating omega on the boundary of my geometry. Then it really shows that this is omega wedge product with delta partial uh, sigma. So what that says is the exterior derivative of my direct delta form of the surface is the direct delta form of my boundary. As a result, go back to the Plato's problem, we can change our constraint into this exterior derivative, which is very linear. Uh, well, what is very linear? Linear is linear. There's no such thing as very linear into this linear constraint. OK, so let's reformulate our area functional then. Uh, how do we understand area functional in terms of direct delta form? Uh, we claim that this is the same as the mass norm of uh, our Dirac delta forms. But what is mass norm? Mass norm is the operator norm of this differential forms with regard to L infinity norm. So what is L infinity norm or sup norm? Sup norm is understood as um, you uh, take the local Euclidean norm and you take uh, point-wise supremum. But what is local Euclidean norm? Uh, it is you take, if you have any um, two forms, then you can take, uh, you can view it as a vector field. You just take the square uh, square of each of its components and then um, take the square root. So just to go bottom up again, right? So for each of the test forms, we can compute its local Euclidean norm, which is for anything, any two forms written like this, I just take each of the components and then take the squares and then take square root. So this is my point-wise Euclidean norm. This is a function defined on every point of my ambient space. And then my sup norm is taking supremum of this value, you know, amongst all of the points inside my ambient space. And then my operator norm is to say, okay, I'm going to take the supremum over all of the test forms such that their sup norm is less than or equal to one, right? So it's on this unit ball with regard to sup norm, and I'm going to take it's the supremum of its absolute value. So why is this the area of my uh, of my surface, right? So so now if I have direct uh, direct delta of a surface, right, then the mass norm is the supremum of delta sigma applied on any um, test form such that its sup norm is less than or equal to one. But don't forget, you know, in terms of vector fields, this is just saying that omega uh, is linked to vector fields with, uh, with local Euclidean norm less than or equal to one. So the magnitude of this vector field less than or equal to one. Then you can view it as, okay, so uh, if I consider all of the vector fields with magnitude less than or equal to one, right, integrated on the surface, right, I have this V dot N DS, right, then if I take supremum over all of these vector fields V, right, then the best way to maximize this at every point would be V is the, exactly the same as the normal of my surface, right, so that being the case, I'm really just integrating one DS of my entire, uh, over my surface sigma, and this is, of course, the area of sigma. So we change our objective function from area uh, to just mass norm of the distract delta form. And then we propose that if we extend our search from just Dirac delta one forms to all of the one forms, then this is a convex problem. And what's really nice is that this is a relaxed problem, right? We relax from being restricting to only Dirac, uh, Dirac delta forms to any of the one forms. But uh, it is guaranteed that this convex problem will still give us the minimum uh, of the original problem. So we see previously error functional is non-convex, but this time it is no longer non-convex. 
X because in terms of any one forms, right, then we can definitely consider something that looks like delta sigma plus theta delta sigma plus one minus theta delta sigma uh, two. So sigma one and sigma two. So if one each of the local minimum, one is called sigma one, the other one is called sigma two, then the convex combinations are indeed in our feasible set. And then any of these would actually be an outcome of our algorithm. Uh, so here is a um, here is a visualization of our minimization process. On the upper right, we have the cloud rendering of the one form, and on the lower right is the um, is the vector field rendering of our uh, of our one form. Uh, so let's take a look at the unique challenge coming from this relaxed puzzle problem. Uh, it's not just the fact that um well yeah it's it's not just that oh you know we we have uh we do have a theorem that um the minimum of the relaxed problem will uh, will be the same as the original problem um but the feasible set of this um the feasible set of this relaxed puzzle problem is hmm? Oh, hmm? that was weird okay the, uh, the feasible set of this relaxed problem is something uh, something such that you are taking any one forms such that the exterior derivative of it is delta sigma, uh, delta gamma, sorry. And we see that because all of them has to satisfy this constraint, D of it equals something. So then indeed, this is an affine set that is parallel to the kernel of D. Right, and as a result, if we can assume that the uh, first cohomology is zero, meaning that the kernel of D is just image of D, then we can turn our feasible set into this, which is just saying that uh, our solution needs to look like some, any feasible solution, eta naught, plus a D phi. So we have this linear equation that says eta equals eta naught plus D phi, and then if I, we take these two particular variables, we can design our ADMM algorithm. Uh, we have the first minimization problem for the variable phi, uh, which looks like the, uh, the L2 minimization with D phi, right? There's no phi term, there's only D phi. So if we complete the squares, then essentially this is minimizing the L2 distance squared of D phi with something else. So as a result, right, um, a quick calculus of variation, right, uh, we can turn this into the Poisson problem. So we solve that uh, the uh, Laplacian of phi is coming from some source term. All right, so the second minimization problem from our linear equation, eta equals eta naught plus d phi, right? Uh, the second problem is saying that, oh, so um, it's essentially saying at every point of my entire ambient space, right, I'm minimizing the uh, Euclidean norm of my one form eta p uh, minus something after completing the square is phi uh, phi minus some other some other things l2 norm square so on the right hand side we can show we can see that this is really just minimizing a vector such that uh, uh, minimizing for a, minimizing this um, the Euclidean norm of a vector plus some constant times uh, the normed square of x minus something so this is quite common in uh, L L1 minimization. And we know procedurally this can be done by an operator called shrink. We, all that we know is, we all that we need to know is the value, the vector value of the something and the value of tau. So if we can procedurally do this, then uh, uh, the optimality formula of this minimization problem is just applying shrink at every particular point, right? So this is just some point-wise attribute. Well, there's a problem, which is, we can't always assume that first cohomology is trivial. So in this case, we will have the problem with uh, periodic boundary artifact, which is, so if we solve our problem with 
of say fast Fourier transform, assuming periodic boundary condition, then our ambient space is necessarily the three-dimensional torus. Then if we are on three-dimensional torus and we have this uh, ring in the middle and we want to compute minimal surfaces, then it's really hard to say if pink is more optimal or uh, blue is more optimal, right? If we want to do this for uh, for the problem of finding minimal surfaces that are actually embedded in R3, then yeah, pink is not actually a continuous minimal, uh, you know, continuous surface in R3. But it is true that it is a continuous surface in uh, three tours, and then it might have a smaller surface area than the blue one. So how do we actually only get the blue ones? Well, then we first have to say, well, yes, it is true that we have non-trivial cohomology in, on three torus, right? We have, we know that we have these three vector fields, H1 and H2 and H3, they each point to the X, Y, and Z directions. Um, and they are, they are constant vector fields, so they are, they are curl-free. But we know that on the periodic uh, setting, right, these are not the gradient of anything. If we are just talking about a box in R, R3, then yes, they are the gradient of a function that goes from zero and then to one over n, to two over n, to something, something, and then to one, right? But because we need to have periodic boundary condition, if we are on three torus, then these functions really cannot be the gradient of anything that satisfies periodic boundary condition. So as a result, we observe that, oh, so what does these cohomology uh, generators do, right? If we take these vector fields and then apply it with any uh, direct delta form, delta sigma, then essentially we are taking uh, the constant vector field EI, right, pointing towards either X or Y or Z directions, or literally any other directions. Uh, uh, and then when you do this, uh, when you dot product it with n sigma, right? So then you dot product the normal direction of the surface in the constant uh, vector fields, then you just project the entire uh, integration domain from sigma to the projected uh, area along the i direction. Then if you integrate this, this is the sine area of the projected um, sigma. And in fact, if you collect uh, the this integral result, the sign area of three different uh, three different directions, then you actually just get the area vector of your boundary curve. So we show the result that okay, if we actually add some constraint that says uh, the my minimization variable needs to in uh, needs to act on these. Uh, constant vector fields uh, such that they will integrate to a very specific numbers. For example, if I allow, um, impose that they will always integrate to the values of my area vectors, then it is true that I just resolve the minimal surface that appears in R3. And if I impose any other value, then my minimization just converges to, uh, to whatever minimal surface that really has these prescribed projected area at uh, each three directions. So on the right hand side, the X and Z directions are all uh, will all have a projected area that is one, whereas if you look from the top to bottom, right, you look at the Y axis, then yes, the projected area is, um, is uh, one minus the uh, just the disk. So from here, oops, um, from here, then we conclude that, yeah, if so, if we want to do the computation on three toruses, then we can just add these cohomology constraint. And in my admissible set, miraculously, guess what? Um, so if we really look at this a bit, uh, so from Hodge decomposition, we know that the space of all one forms can be decomposed into the image uh, of D and then the image of delta or the uh, or the orthogonal component, component of kernel of D and the uh, cohomology part, right? Then when I, the first condition uh, says that I have a uh, feasible set, right? Uh, that is parallel to the kernel of D. So which is shown by this blue uh, plane. Now, if I try to add the additional cohomology condition, these equations, right? So they are saying that whatever one form that I have, they have to uh, inner product with the uh, generators or the basis of my cohomology group to a very specific value. So this gives me a orthogonal component 
to the cohomology group, uh, which is uh, H1, right? So if you take the intersection saying that both of these two conditions have to be satisfied, well, you just end up with these line, which is parallel to the image of D. So we get back to the previous, the sum, uh, previous conclusion, which is if uh, previously we said, if my cohomology is trivial, then uh, my feasible set is really just any feasible solution, eta naught plus image of D, right? So then we have the uh, equation for ADMM, we have eta equals eta naught plus D phi, right? So in this case, we show that even for computation on three torus, right? Simply because we want the result to look like the ones appearing in R3, we added these cohomology con constraint and then they gives us exactly the same Feasible, uh, feasible set. So we can use exactly the same ADMM algorithm. So here are some results. We'll actually probably come back to this uh, video clip. But uh, yeah, you can see that we really can produce these intricate topologies um, despite the uh, despite that our um, our boundaries could have a lot of interlinking. Uh, we can also handle uh, periodic minimal surfaces simply because we are operating with one forms, right? And one forms are definitely ad uh, additive. So if we have several of them, we just add them all together, then we get a periodic one. Uh, here's a comparison with real world footage. And we can also use this to perform um, curve interpolations and just know that the interesting part is that we can interpolate between uh, curves of different uh, topology. Now, uh, the very last part of the presentation is about how to generalize this concept to uh, something else, right? So observe that what we did is essentially we have a mass or minimization with a differential constraint. So a general geometric least square problem often looks very similar, except that they don't have mass norm, they have L2 norm. There are some differential constraints and there's L2 norm minimization. For example, Poisson surface reconstruction, the process is that, okay, um, I want to minimize the L2 norm between a um, concentrated uh, um, concentrated vector field. And I want to say, I have a function whose gradient is this uh, vector field. On top of this, we also have electric field minimization, which is given any uh, point charges distribution. Then I want to find the uh, electric, electric field such that its uh, divergence is this point charge. So take the Poisson surface reconstruction, for example, if we replace the L2 norm with the mass norm, then we are actually going to get an even more robust surface reconstruction because uh, mass norm minimization is much more, um, is much more, uh, gives much more sparse results. Uh, in particular, um, our, uh, our, our output would be a function with a jump. Hmm? I didn't even do anything and it just comes up. Uh, with a jump at, ooh, am I, am I still we sharing lost the screen? iPad, I think. Yeah, we, we lost the screen share. Oh. Just now though. Oh. Hmm. Oh, well, it comes back. That's weird. I'll get it. Um, well, yeah, so if we minimize mass norm for the Poisson surface reconstruction problem, then uh, the function that we ended up with is just not just something that has a uh, level set that's exactly at the, uh, the holes uh, where we expect it. In fact, we have a function who has an entire jump in its value at the at the place where you want to fill in the holes. So as a result, if we try to take the level set of this function, right, then because it has a big jump over there, it's much more stable with the exact ISO offset value that you choose for your level set. Well, on the other hand, the, um, in, uh, the electric field uh, examples, if we replace the L2 norm with mass norm, right, so Showing this result is the black uh, lines are the electric fields generated by the uh, red and blue particles on the bunny, right? Then if we replace it by mass norm, then this is actually the optimal transport problem uh, with L2 norm or sometimes called Beckman problem because this is essentially um, computing 
a vector field such that uh, it's um, its divergence is the difference of two distribution. Uh, to summarize, we present this Eulerian geometry representation uh, alongside with general mass norm minimization problems. The Eulerian geometry representation is fully differentiable, uh, so it would be very suitable for inverse rendering or other 3D deep learning tasks. And the, uh, the representation is also convex because we have a representation um, that can allowed manifold superposition, right? So um, so then for a feasible set, they're actually interconnected. Uh, they are, it's, it's actually connected. Uh, and then there, the sparsity of the result can be provided by throwing in the mass norm minimization. And we show that by exactly computing the very sparse minimal surface uh, example. There are indeed some uh, limitations. For example, our surface representation for now cannot do non-manifold surfaces, uh, non-manifold surfaces, because if we go back to the very beginning of differential forms, they are using uh, curve integrals or surface integrals. These are all oriented integrals, uh, and as a result, right, we also can't do oriented surfaces. Um, so, uh, thank you for your attention. Here's more uh, results, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I could look at the results for like the rest, of the, the rest of the session, just we could all stare at them together. They're so amazing. Uh, we're going to start with our questions. We have many questions for both of you. I'm going to start with some questions that we have for Leanne, uh, so that Stephanie can get a glass of water or whatever she wants. Um, OK. so. I'm going to put two questions together because we have uh, too many of them. So I'm going to kind of ask them at the same time. Uh, one is what uh, specific conditions do the performance metrics that, that you have have to satisfy, like um, continuity or smoothness or anything like that with respect to the, the, the um, uh, function that you're optimizing. And then the, the other related question is, if I wanted to minimize for one specific uh, evaluation tasks. So for example, if I had your algorithm, but uh, I was, like you mentioned with the house, I was uh, optimizing for some aesthetic intuition that wasn't very, you know, quantifiable. Uh, and I had to like ask someone at every point, like, do you like this one better than this one? You know, so it's like a very costly evaluation. Uh, how would I optimize that? I would need to uh, ask that question the, the, the least, I guess. It's, it's a big question. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, those are super interesting. Um, so for the first one, what we're assuming theoretically is that they're um, continuous and at least twice differentiable because we need uh, Hessian or Hessian-like matrices with second derivatives. Um, functionally, right now, we're assuming that we can, or to like practically in our implementation, we've only done things that we can differentiate analytically. So we're doing this all in MATLAB. Um, and letting MATLAB handle all of those things for us. But like the theory should extend to things like uh, XFEM from Hofner et al. Um, that do you know differentiable CAD simulations. And we think that's pretty interesting. Um, and for the, the second question, this is actually super interesting. I don't know how to optimize how to ask this question the least, but one thing that's interesting about the Pareto gamut is that like, so let's say you have, um, a lot that's like occluded by trees on one side. So like your morning output is going to be awful. So you're going to focus more on the designs that are good in the evening. Um, and then you can actually, like once you've picked a functional trade-off that you care about, you can actually just run right up and down the gamut on that area. Um, so like a vertical slice in the way that we were presenting our results and then grab all of the things that are functionally identical, but only vary on this aesthetic constraint. And so you can sort of almost scroll through them um, and huh. choose the regions that you like because they're, because of the way the problem set up, it's also almost a continuous change um, between those things. And so you can sort of, yeah, just-, just and, you, and you've already computed the gamut. So I could like literally yep. scroll and see the- Yeah. So the gamut, you know, you start it, you get a coffee, you come back, and then it's ready for you. It depending on Perfect. how complicated your problem is. Maybe you, uh, <laughs> maybe you have a few coffees and then come back. Okay, uh, okay, that, that's uh, the next question we have for you. But let's let's uh, go to Stephanie now because um, we have some questions for you. I'm gonna also pack two together. Um, 
because there's too many of them. Uh, the first is uh, this integral, this uh, form is defined on some closed compact space, right? So like, is it the convex whole of the curves that you have or what is it? The convex whole of what? Like, is it is it is it is there a box that's bounding everything that you're defining the function on? Like, what? Uh, yes. Where is? Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, the question that I had is, could you add like some weights or some something to certain regions of space where you wouldn't want the surface to to be, for example? Yes, we totally can, right? Uh, in fact, the way to do that would be in the uh, mass norm computations. You, you just add some, you can just adjust the weight of each point in, in your ambient space, right? And then in fact, this is one way that would be, uh, uh, would be beneficial if, say, I have the exact example where there's two um, symmetrical local minimums, right, then you can actually add just a tiny bit of weight in your space, right? You don't even need to know uh, ahead of time, but, uh, well, if you just add a little bit, right, then the outcome of your of, of the algorithm will no longer be any superposition of two um, local minimum. It would just right. be... Right. 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 So that's I hadn't thought of that use case. The, the use case I had in mind is like I'm I'm trying to find the what the soap bubble would look like, but there's like a figurine in the middle that it it it, um, it will never touch, right? So that I could just add a, a big weight to that area. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Uh, next question, uh, still for Stephanie, is is it possible to generalize this to four dimensions? So find the minimal volume, and instead of interpolating between curves, you could interpolate between surfaces. Totally, totally. Yes, this um, the differential forms. You can easily generalize it. The only thing you can do is to change the um, the degree of your forms from one to two, or two to three, or any any number. And what problem would we like? Why aren't we looking at at four uh, D results? Is it a matter of performance or? Uh, well. You know, for example, our results, they are computed on three-dimensional grids. So yes, if you try to have a ambient space that's very high dimension, then of course you'll get curse of dimensionality. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, makes sense. I'm, I'm excited to, to see the, the surface interpolation that fills in between like different topologies, like the, the bunny one at the end. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that sounds really fun, right? Yeah, I don't even know what it would look like, but it certainly sounds fun. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question uh, for Lian. Again, two questions that I'm making into one. Uh, question one is, what is the scalability of your method? For example, if I wanted to optimize the design of a car where you have many internal components and many interactions and relationships among them, you can see that this is the, the, the how many copies do I need to grab before, uh, that's why I, I cut you off before. And the next question, which I guess you also touch on in answering this is, Sorry if I missed it, but why exactly does it work with four metrics, but it becomes intractable with five? Yeah, um, both again, excellent questions. So in terms of scalability, the examples that we showed in the in the paper and the presentation, the turbine is the fastest and that runs in about a minute to compute the whole gamut. And uh, the bicopter example that I briefly touched on with two performance metrics and two contexts takes about 21 hours, but that has 100 design variables, I think. Um, and also you're computing, like effectively what happens with the contexts is that for each dimension you add, if you discretize them, then you also run into cursive dimensionality. Uh, and so for the bicopter, we're essentially computing 10,000 fixed contexts. And so you can imagine as the engineer sitting there 10,000 times to run them all, which doesn't sound like fun. Um, and if you looked at the amortized time over the amount of information we compute, uh, it ends up still you you coming out ahead. Um, in terms of scalability for like, I imagine the car with many adjacent components is similar, most similar to the bicycle example. And right now, because you can't do more than two contexts, it's pretty tough to do um, proper hierarchical design where you know you've got connections all over the place, even for this bike suspension. If you wanted to optimize the whole thing with four pivot points, you'd already be using up your, your allowances to have um, two performance metrics and then two context parameters on each side. And that only controls one dimension in the way that we've set it up so far. So you can only move it vertically um, and not horizontally if you wanna split between multiple parts. 
so there's definitely a lot of work to be done on that front for it to be um you know practical for something on the scale of a car interior <laughs> or exterior um and we're most sensitive to the to the number of performance and context um dimensions and that's just because of this the scalability issue so uh, the the curse of dimensionality so we were actually kind of surprised that it works for four in a reasonable amount of time um i'm not i'm not quite sure what the intuition is for why we don't run into that problem so also for multi-objective optimization you can do for performance metrics, it's just, you know, now you're in the scenario where it takes eight hours or 21 hours and it's not really considered right. tractable anymore. Okay, so got it. So no, nothing magical happens at, at, at dimension five that suddenly makes it impossible. It's just a matter of no, how just, long the coffee yeah. break. Yeah, you just get tired of taking a coffee break. <laughs> Okay, I see. I guess that will happen at some point in my life. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. Uh, okay, uh, now the, the last uh, pair of questions for Stephanie. And also, if, if you could, uh, Stephanie, stop the screen share because I'm going to need that uh, for a second. So uh, this is basically the, the same uh, question asked in, by two different kinds of people. So the first one is uh, uh, saying that this direct delta thing looks magical. How can it turn? How can it turn a challenging non-convex problem into a convex one? That's the the first the, like the the surprise nice way of saying it. The second one is wait, they would just get a free lunch. Our area functionals are non-convex by definition, and it started not as non-convex, and now it is convex. What did we pay? What what did we pay, or did we pay, anything, or did we not pay anything at all, and we got a free lunch? Um, yeah, great question. Um, we also found that it turned the whole turning non-convex problem into a convex problem being very amazing. Uh, so I guess the the thought is really that if, say, imagine a two-dimensional region, and then you are only nitpicking points on, on somewhere around here, because they are one single surfaces, right? So then by considering all of the one forms, you are essentially considering all of the convex holes of these points, right? So the, you know, you can say the price that you are paying is that then you allow that during the intermediate step of your minimization, you might actually have a fuzzy surface, right? It's not exactly um, just one clear surface. Sometimes it can be fuzzy, right? It would be, you know, similar to the theta of one Dirac delta form plus one minus theta of the other Dirac delta form, right? So I would say the things that we need to be careful with when eating this free lunch is that if you want to throw in um, throw in this geometry geometry representations, right? Then of course you want to make sure that okay, if I allow myself to consider any uh, any superposition of geometries, then I need to make sure that at the end of the day, my optimization is going to output one geometry uh, right. one surface instead of a bunch of fuzzy surfaces, right? Because in fact, you can get a um, you can get a you know and uncountably many surfaces all superpositioned together um so yeah so that would be the price that we're paying but you know as we said we propose that if you actually just use mass or minimization that it gives really good sparsity right okay so there is a, yeah it's, it's not free it's like a convex realization just a very smart way of doing a convex realization of, of the problem uh, okay, uh, and uh, the, the final question, uh, Stephanie, is what is the story behind this di discovery? How did you find that this representation could be such a great solution to the minimal surface problem? Um, I I think this really has to be credited to Albert. Uh, I, as far as I know, he was thinking about, you know, if functions can be extended to Dirac delta then essentially differential forms are some kind of functions with dx, dy, dz, right? Then why can't we have Dirac delta differential forms, right? And this is one application that we found in asking this question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this is a fascinating area of study. Just your paper, reading it, watching your uh, cigarette talk, it's uh, makes me excited to see what else can we you, like redefine minimizations and op shape optimizations on uh, using this this whole framework. 
so anyway, I, I was saying thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Leanne, for coming. Uh, these were two amazing talks. I'm very happy I uh, was very lucky and got to host this session. Uh, now, before we wrap up for the day, let us all thank our speakers warmly in the chat and myself, and uh, also tell you that you can join us. Um, wait, hold on. I should also thank our uh, artists for the poster for this week, an amazing poster by Suharu Ogawa. Um, and see you all next Friday at noon Eastern time to hear from Caitlin Miller and Mackenzie Lee. Uh, have a great day, everyone.